Good morning and a warm welcome to our listeners here in the United States, around the world, and in Africa in particular. I'm Aloysius Uche Odu, Director of the Africa Growth Initiative at Brookings. COVID-19 is clearly the biggest elephant on the global scene right now. The pandemic has laid bare the world's vulnerabilities to health and economic ruin from disease outbreaks. It has also revealed fundamental weaknesses and contradictions in global health. Despite progress towards improved health outcomes, many countries face a complex landscape of ambitious political commitments to universal health coverage, to human capital, and to global health security. Evidently, investors in global health must now navigate a minefield of uneven progress, great expectations, and denials of scientific evidence by entrenched interests. Today, we're delighted to assemble some of the world's leading experts on global health. We will discuss a new book by Dr. Luseji Adeyi, president of Resilient Health Systems. Soji is also a senior associate at Johns Hopkins uh, Bloomberg School of Public Health. He was formerly director health, nutrition, and population at the World Bank. Soji authored a viewpoint for us in our 2022 edition of Foresight Africa. His book is called titled Global Health in Practice, Investing Amidst Pandemics, Denial of Evidence, and New dependency. Soji, a warm welcome to you. Thank you very much, Aloysius. And I want to thank you and your team at Brookings uh, for giving us the opportunity to have this conversation today. Great. And I thank our panelists uh, for joining us. Right. Let me begin. Um, yeah. Let me begin by pointing out my favorite sentence in the book. It's the very last sentence in the very last chapter. And that is, a brighter future is possible. But here we are today. Global health is broken. Global health is very unhappy. And COVID-19 is a catastrophic problem for health and for economic development. But COVID-19, is really not the fundamental problem of global health. All COVID-19 has done is to put in stark relief the pre-existing conditions of global health. So we simplify and put them in two main buckets, but those two buckets are interrelated. The first one is the problem of power imbalance between the global north and the global south because at its core, global health is about power. Now, that is not to discount health status, health outcomes, epidemiology, public health, health economics, and all those underlying disciplines, but at its core, it's about power. The second problem is that of new dependency, the new dependency of the global south on the global north which features a situation in which the global south is dependent on dominant powers of the global north for setting goals, for determining when the global south can have what, on whose terms, and where. So before we go into further details, what will it take to reinvent global health? There are really just three main parts to it. The first one is to end foreign aid for all essential commodities and basic health services in global health. Yes, you had that right. End foreign aid for basic health commodities and health services. The second one is to overhaul what is now called technical assistance so that it becomes led by, managed by, and determined 
not by providers and financiers in the global north, but by the beneficiary countries. That is the third, that's the second one. The third one is to now refocus foreign aid where its added value is highest. And that's in the realm of global and regional public goods. The institutions uh, that will help enable the production of those public goods and prevent the advent of public bads. And those institutions include, but are not limited to those for surveillance, outbreak detection and effective response. Also in that third bucket, research and development capacity in the global South. So those are the three essential changes. This is not a call to end foreign aid today. It's an eight year window. Why eight years? The world has committed in the United Nations to universal health coverage by 2030. So everyone will have an eight year notice. This is the eight year planning period. What will this mean in practice? We'll, we'll get to discuss this uh, in quite a few uh, details. But before COVID came along, as of 2017, based on estimates published uh, by a group that included the WHO, about 75% or 76%, so three quarters of uh, foreign aid for health was going to country specific functions and the remaining one quarter was going to what you might call global commons or global goods and R&D, et cetera, et cetera. So in fact, the, the need for this stoppage is for that, 70, for the, for that 76%. What does this mean? It means profound shift in power. And in order to understand where the, the structure of that power and why addressing power is so fundamental, we need to go back in history. I will be brief. We could go back many centuries, but we'll go back just 124 years. Why? In the colonial era, as well as the era of the transatlantic slave trade, many cities benefited from shipping people into slavery, especially port cities. One of those port cities was the city of Liverpool in England, from which ships that transported 20% of enslaved Africans across the Atlantic originated. But this was not about the Atlantic alone. We're also talking about colonialism in Asia, for example, and adventurism in Latin America. So the sailors and merchants were coming down with what seemed to be exotic diseases, if you were European, and they were called tropical diseases. So in a way to understand, in an attempt to understand those diseases and to protect their investments in colonial adventures in the, 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 the trades that were going on, merchants got together and a man named Alfred Jones put down 350 pounds to found the venerable Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine, one of my alma maters an extraordinary institution. And the school will investigate those outbreaks and provide treatment in collaboration with some facilities in the city. Six months later, the London School of Tropical Medicine, as it was then called, opened its doors. That one was financed directly by the Treasury of the United Kingdom. And in a remarkable footnote, the government recouped that money from the colonies. So in fact, the colonies paid to found the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Not to be outdone, King Leopold of Belgium established one as well. And then there's one in Amsterdam and on and on and on. So you get the picture across the Atlantic. In the early part of the last century, the, the Rockefeller Foundation invested in a lot of schools of public health across the world. And in fact, uh, it put money into uh, starting up the schools of public health at the Johns Hopkins University, another of my alma maters, and the Harvard University. What does this mean? 
There emerged a knowledge-based network, and they have made extraordinary contributions to, global, to, 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 to medicine and public health and science. That must be recognized. The other side of the coin was that this network was essentially the health brigade of colonialist adventures. Now, time moved on. The Second World War came. The Second World War ended. And we enter the, the, what has evolved into the modern era of development assistance for health or foreign aid. But something did not change. In fact, it became cemented. Last year, the Washington Post, whose offices are just down the road from where I'm speaking, published a series of unfortunate editorials by its editorial board. You can check them out. And one of them concluded at the height of the Delta wave of, of, uh, of COVID after denying the usefulness of waiving intellectual property on, on, uh, on, on vaccine and similar technologies, the Washington Post editorial board concluded about the global South, quote, let us give them what they, what they really need. Why is that sentence important? It encapsulates a mindset in which a select group decide what the others need. It did not say, let us find a way to work with them to achieve their needs as they have identified and expressed them. That was the same year when the special envoy of the African Union for COVID said, on COVID vaccine said, no, the African Union was not basing its priority or its, its strategy on donations. They wanted to buy. But the wealthy countries of Europe and North America would not have it. They wanted to donate. And it's because politically, donation is at the instance of the donor. It preserved that power. Okay. Now, this is not a session on saying how much the global north is at fault. Last year, the Africa Forum, which brings together former heads of state, was pleading for the continuation of foreign aid to treat neglected tropical diseases just because the United Kingdom was courting its foreign aid budget. That was an abdication of responsibility by those African leaders. And it is a symptom of new dependency. Last year, after 120 years following the explanation of the transmission of malaria by Ronald Ross, for which he won the Nobel Prize, the WHO approved and recommended wider use of the RTSS malaria vaccine. One would have thought that African leaders will be jumping up and down saying, Finally, for this age old disease, we are going to pay for these vaccines for ourselves. That did not happen. Instead, Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance, said they were going to put in $156 million into that. Let us be very clear. That move by Gavi was inappropriate, and quite frankly, it is reprehensible because it, con it continues to undermine the agency of governments in the global South, especially, but not only in Africa, to take charge of their own affairs. You're beginning to see the picture, but we're not done yet. When you look at the channels through which power is wielded, something very interesting becomes clear. Let's go over them very quickly. Take the WHO the world's leading health agency. WHO now gets under 20% of its total money from assessed contributions. The rest comes from extra budgetary contributions. You might say, what is wrong with that? Well, there's plenty that's wrong with it. It means the WHO is now a purchasable contractor because it is terribly underfunded. WHO has become a general contractor and you can just buy WHO and send it where you want it to go. So if you're Germany, 
you can pay and have a new entity for pandemic and epidemic surveillance on your territory. If you're France, you can pay for an academy and have it in Lyon. If you're Switzerland, you can pay and have the uh, bio hub in Switzerland. Again, you're getting the picture. If you go to international financial institutions, such as the IMF and the World Bank, where I worked for years, they've contributed a lot in terms of policy analysis, in terms of policy advice, in terms of just the sheer amount of knowledge products they put out there, and also program financing. Let's face it, those contributions have been punctuated over the years by misadventures like the Structural Adjustment Program. I know quite a bit about that because as a physician in Lagos, I witnessed patients being discharged from the hospital because they could not pay. In fact, that is the reason I went to public health because I wanted to be where those policies were being made rather than being at the receiving end of those policies. Also, the squeamishness about investing in AIDS, the reluctance to get in in the first instance, and more, rec more, more, most recently, the failure of the much hyped pand pandemic emergency facility, the PEF. I also witnessed firsthand the extraordinary difficulty of securing funds for the Africa CDC. It really should not be hard to get funds for something that is so painfully obvious and necessary. If you go to the multilateral grant financiers, such as Gavi and the Global Fund, look, they invest in specific lines of work. And for the child in Nepal, the pregnant woman in Ghana, or the cab driver in El Salvador who gets some of those services, that's a good thing. So this is not about whether each individual service is bad or not. So what is it about? Hear me out. The very construct, because it is going on in perpetuity, the very construct is a power vehicle, again, for Northern powers to ride roughshod over the global South. And it provides cover for many governments in the global South to not take responsibility for the health of their own people, because the locus of accountability is not in Southern capitals it moves to where those grant financiers are. So anybody who is going to do replenishment, and this needs to be said clearly, should be doing replenishment for transitioning out, not replenishment for self-perpetuation of any institution. If you go to bilateral grant financiers, the poster child for this is the United States Agency for International Development. And I want to be very clear. There are thousands of people there who go to work every day as serious professionals, and I want to salute them. So this is not about anybody's intention. But the fundamental fact is this. The business model of USAID is wrong. If you wanted to invent an entity, that will not make substantial contributions to development, that will not result in sustainable gains, the model you develop is USAID. It's entirely captured by contractors. And worse than that, as you will see in chapter four of the book, USAID, and at the time, as well as the US President's Malaria Initiative, deliberately undermine an innovation that was going to save money and was projected to save lives in the global south. That was the affordable medicines facility for malaria. I detail this in chapter four of the book. This was a modality for local supply chains in the development countries themselves to get the drugs to people. So today, USAID has continued with its model where it puts billions of dollars into foreign contractors to go and run supply chains in developing countries through central medical stores and sometimes in parallel. Its own Office of Inspector General has documented some serious problems in that business model in its large 
supply chain contract. Well, guess what? USAID is now preparing to have an even bigger contract than that. The reason is beyond me, because one of the things we learned in kindergarten and definitely in primary one, that's elementary year one, is that if you multiply zero by 100, you get zero. If you multiply zero by 1 billion, you still get zero. And I think this is the lesson that USAID needs to learn. It's a waste of taxpayers' money, quite frankly. Now, if you go to foundations, and here we use the Gates Foundation, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation as an example. Again, they have funded many useful things across the world. We must recognize that. But you must ask yourself, why is it that the bulk of the awards still go to or through Northern-based institutions? Why are hundreds of millions of dollars going to the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation in Seattle when they could put that money into probably 20 different places in the global south? And those places will actually have more connections with the reality of those countries. You must ask yourself if this is the way to go. Finally, the Northern NGOs. Many Northern NGOs do great work. They go to extremely difficult, challenging places, and I want to salute them. It is also true, hear me out, that a select group of Northern NGOs have cornered a process in which they try to bully international agencies into dictating to Southern countries the preferred policies of those NGOs. So they seek to exact authority without responsibility. And this is a problem. It is a serious problem. And in fact, they even exert this, this pressure on leaders of the global north because they are so noisy. And we need to, we need to, we need to call these things out. So you have this, you, you have this, what I call the superstructure or the meta system that thrives on power imbalances, northern elite capture, and a lot of rent seeking that's going on in global health. And that is why a serious solution needs to be found. More tinkering will not do. Mere refinement of the current system will not do. I read somewhere, I think it was a quote attributed to Oren Harari, that electric light did not come from continuous improvement of candles. And a lot of what is going on in this course right now is tinkering with the candle in the hope that you get electric light from solar energy. It's not going to happen. So for the global south, if nothing has been clear before, one thing is now clear. In moments of great peril, such as a one in a century pandemic, you are on your own. Anybody who did not get that before must have registered it by now. And it, this may sound harsh, but it is the truth. What is the truth, colleagues? Fairness is not the currency of geopolitics in global health. And despite everything you might have heard to the contrary, a serious push for equity is not the currency in the geopolitics of global health. So the global South needs to face its reality. Nobody is coming to save you from the global North. I'm not talking about individual goodwill. There are thousands of our colleagues in the global North who are extraordinary professionals who work day and night to make things better with colleagues in the global South. One must recognize that explicitly. So this is not about individuals. I'm talking about the meta system, the construct, okay? So since nobody is coming to save the global South, the global South needs to self-emancipate from this new dependency. And that emancipation, the path to it is what I call increasingly self-financed assertiveness. That's what it is. Now, to avoid any doubt, as I wrote in the book, colonialism was bad. 
it was accompanied by massive crimes against humanity. Its effects endure till today. And the calls for decolonizing global health are legitimate. They are right. At the same time, the more fundamental problem is not neocolonialism. The cancer is not neocolonialism. The cancer, the very aggressive cancer, is new dependency. And Northern activists, Northern agencies, Northern institutions who do not frankly say this, who are still pushing endless rounds of grants, endless replenishment on CNN and BBC with faded pop stars and soccer stars and all those things. Nothing against soccer stars. I love the game, okay? They're doing a disservice to the global South because they're infantilizing global South leaders. They are preventing the global South countries, the citizens, from effectively holding their own leaders to account because the locus for accountability is so far away. And this is what needs to change. Now, there will be plenty of opposition uh, to what I've just said. If you're a donor and you insist on continuing to finance commodities, and here, folks at USAID, they need to listen up. And anybody with similar inclinations, stop buying commodities and hiring contractors to go and deliver them to the natives. This is, 20, this is 2022. You can subsidize those commodities at the factory gate and then get out of the way. Let country institutions private and public sector, let them do the importation by themselves or let them choose their own procurement agents and let them do the distribution in country. Now, if you subsidize those commodities at the factory gate, even if country budgets do not increase from one year to the next, the purchasing power of those budgets will increase because you subsidize them, you subsidize the product at the factory gate. So there is no rational basis for USAID to continue its current business model. It's a waste of taxpayers' money. Anybody who insists on continuing technical assistance, well, you can set up a challenge fund or a, uh, a drawdown fund. And so the government of the developing country will decide what year it wants. It will write a terms of reference do the procurement and put it in public on the web so there's transparency. There is no longer any reason for donors from the global north to be stipulating that this particular entity is the one that's going to provide technical assistance in this particular setting. These are very important things to note. And from the global south, if you hear any leader of the global south say, oh, this is not going to work, this cannot be done, you must ask them, who is benefiting from the current system? Because part of the reason you will hear objection is the fear of taking responsibility. It's a fear of being accountable. Let me share one thing with you. And what I'm about to say didn't come from just one country. Country after country after country. When you have a quiet conversation, I say, why is it that you are graduating from low income to low middle income, but you're not putting more money into your health sector? Folks will say, look, we're not stupid. We know that if we don't do anything, those people from Europe and North America who love us more than we love ourselves, will hold replenishment meetings, they will raise billions, and they will, they will continue to supply the goods and services. That is what is going on. One does not need to be an expert economics, uh, economist in game theory to see how the system has been gamed and is being gamed. That is what is going on. So I want to uh, conclude here as I started by referring to, again, my favorite sentence in the book, which is the very last sentence in the book, 
that says a brighter future is possible. Thank you very much. Back to you, Aloysius. Soji, thank you very, very much. That was quite um, a, a, a comprehensive coverage. And um, again, the book is titled Global Health in Practice, Investing Amidst Pandemics, Denial of Evidence, and New Dependency. Let me now turn and introduce our esteemed panel. Today we have Mr. Haji Alsai, Chairman of the Board, Kofi Annan Foundation. We also have Honorable Keith Martin, Executive Director, Consortium of Universities of Global Health. And we have Ridva Renika, Professor, Helsinki Graduate School of Economics. I bid you all a warm welcome. It is, okay. So here is what we're going to do today. Viewers can submit questions by emailing events at brookings.edu or via Twitter at Brookings Global. Health, uh, Brookings Global. Um, let me turn to Ridva first. It's indeed wonderful to see you again. You worked with Soji for many, many years at the World Bank. Now he's written this book, some might say very provocative book about the market and government failures in global health. As a development economist with vast experience, can you tell us why these issues are so important? Thank you very much. And thank you, Soji, for a fiery presentation, as fiery as the book is. Um, and uh, thank you for inviting me uh, for, for this event. Um, I wanted to, you ask me why these things are important. I think um, health is obviously important. And I think often in the book, Sochi talks about um, what is the role of the public sector? What is the role um, of government? Why is there government activity and therefore donor activity as well? So it's it's really my my take is that you need government because health sector is the one that has the biggest market failures there are, and uh, this is. Uh, because you need public health, you have the externalities from like we see the pandemic now, and then you have um, catastrophic costs when you get serious illness. So you need interventions in hospitals. So from my perspective, perhaps I would argue that the book takes a view of health sector. And as an economist, I sometimes have an issue with it because it sounds like the government has to do everything uh, because it has to do primary health care, has to do public health, and then hospitals somehow, particularly when insurance markets don't work. And uh, in a way, I didn't quite find that discussion, but it's perhaps not important so much because the book has a different Take. It has a very broad take. And from the public finance point of view, I would argue because like when reading the book, I, I was thinking about this basics issue is why basics but or public health for that matter. Government has no one else is going to do that. But then when, when Sochi very forcefully and provocatively, as you said, pushes this. I, as an economist, was thinking, why is it that we have what we have? And there are reasons. Economists usually look at incentives. And I thought two incentives. And what it means also, it will be difficult to change. One, donors, the so-called global north, uh, in, in the book especially. Uh, they, why do they finance basics? Because they care about poverty. I sometimes feel that donors care about poverty far too much 
because national development is really important. So they want to target poor people. Health is a big issue in poverty. So, so they are vital for poor people and that's why donors often fund the basics. Then when you think of public finance, where I used to work for many years, money is fungible. That's one of the big lessons. What does that mean? It means that if donors pay for vaccines and malaria nets, uh, it's natural that governments put their money elsewhere. So I think Sorti lifts the arguments much higher up for power, etc. I, I I don't have an issue. I can see that when I read the book, I'm a little a few notches down in that. But for me, these are fundamental drivers: the poverty focus and fungibility of money, and they are therefore very difficult to change. So it's even if you tell the leader, uh, please change that, uh, it may not happen because the, the, the motive is not there. Maybe if you allow me one more uh, linked comment on... Uh, please do. Thank you. Uh, so, so when reading this as from the background, so as you mentioned, I'm not a health economist, I'm an economist who has worked in healthcare services, especially both research operation. Then I've worked a lot with ministries of finance, public finance issues, and then education. So I naturally look at this issue from the bigger perspective. And one of the issues, obviously, Sorge's presentation really is about big fundamentals, geopolitics, um, historical perspective. So this is perhaps, uh, as I said, much more sort of lower uh, rungs of, uh, of, of the issues. However, he talks about, for instance, in the book about sector programs and doubts that they in the health sector, you know, reduce any transaction costs. But for me, always these issues are important to look at beyond the health sector. And I wanted to take an example of an, um, of an East African country where I used to work for many, many years. So this, this is how a non-global health person sort of sees it. So in that very country, even the army submitted itself to the country's uh, budgetary process, but the health sector didn't. And, and what its funds came globally from various funds, et cetera. It did not even bother attending the meetings. When the country was building its middle midterm framework for budget, uh, its national budget. So I saw the army guys in their outfits coming to the negotiations. The health people didn't because their money came from elsewhere. So in a way, um, uh, you know, I take actually an issue because my issue perhaps is that uh, that the health sector should not be looked at alone. But overall, I'll finish just with these comments that I do agree with many things in the book based on the limited experience that I have, country ownership. And in a way, my earlier comments are about country ownership, but I want to go beyond just this one area. I, I really agree with the point of private sector that uh, Soji in particular discusses in the context of the malaria program. Technical assistance, yes. Some of it is definitely less than optimal and uh, that both parties bear responsibility, also developing countries. I think that comes out very well. Similarly, the uh, global public good. The book is very theory and provocative. So sometimes I'm a unstated Nordic, so I believe that change may come from being uh, like a little more modest on calling these things, but maybe not. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Riva. That um, leads me to some remarks about contra uh, contrasting Nordics with fearing Nigerians, but um, that's a conversation for another day. Let me talk to you, uh, El Haji, I'll say. Um, you've held 
many, many senior leadership roles in global health and development. Uh, what three things resonate for you strongly when you read this book? Hello? Thank you, Thank you so very yeah, much. Yeah. You know, a number of things, you know, resonate with me. I can trim them uh, down, you know, to three if you want, but initially I had, you know, five. There were just, you know, very five, you know, keywords. And then why those fives? Because I had the pleasure to read this book, you know, through a societal and a political lens. And also have a pleasure to recall many, many, many discussions, you know, you and I had, you know, Soji, when you started, you know, this analysis and this discussion, not today, not because of COVID, you know, not because of Ebola, because these are the two ones, the big ones, you know, that are being quoted a number of times. I remember, so uh, our very, very, very fiery discussions, you know, about primary health care, many, many years ago, you know, at the beginning of the HIV AIDS epidemic, where we had the opportunity to work together, where you also have the same view. And we were together in Abuja in the year 2000, when under the leadership of Kofi Annan, so we brought in African leaders to commit. And there was a commitment, 15% you know, of budget you know, going to health. So this is really, I think, a sense of a deep analysis you know, of all those situations. And then the way you put it together in the book is um, much more comprehensive. You are the equidistance you know, of all the actors out of you know, this uh, dichotomy you know, of the good ones and the bad ones. But you know, a view of a shared accountability across the board and a shared responsibility across the board. And I like particularly, you know, the focus on the African leaders and then the leaders of the global south. And I remember, you know, in um, that was, you know, one of the leaders, you know, of Haiti when uh, he was so tough to the population. And um, you know, his wife said, "Christophe, you are too tough to the people." They said, "Well, I may be too tough, you know, to the humanity, but not tough enough to the people because." You know, we have a greater problem, so then we have to carry greater responsibility. And I think that in that sense, really, that is calling on me. And what are the five things that emerge? I read it and I think of citizenship. I read it and I think of leadership. I read it, I think of accountability. And then I add, you know, two things at the end, which is then solidarity and trust with a question mark. You know, why citizenship? You know, everything starts, you know, with an individual human being that has their own perception of disease, your own perception of health. And then depending on the socioeconomic conditions, you know, within which you are, that will be determining what your health-seeking behaviors will be or not. That will be determining also your therapeutic itineraries that can take you to a traditional healer, to the herbalist, you know, to a health post or even to a hospital. And what will be the determining factor there? It is the economic power. It is the quality of you know, people welcoming you or not. Is it because you know somebody you know, there who's has a renown, who's renowned you know, to be good and then good with people that give you then the confidence you know, and the trust you know, to go there. And that's where it starts. And why we start then with the citizenship right now there? The place you are born or you live or where you grew up end up determining what your status of health will be. You know, um, many children will not reach you know, their fifth birthday simply because they have the misfortune to have been born in a certain setting. Nothing else but that, you know, will determine it. You know, many, you know, will be losing their lives, you know, to treatable conditions because again, you know, the places where you live and then you're born. Now, if we take it now to that individual level, it is that same individual within the citizen, the importance of active citizenship, holding leaders, you know, to account, claiming rights, and also not just be becoming, you know, passive recipients of policies and promises, 
but also shaping, you know, the kind of, you know, health status we want, which is much broader than the health status, which is shaping, you know, the society that we want. And I think I'm seeing the more the importance, you know, of that active citizenship. And COVID has come back and revealed it, exacerbated it, and then put it more, you know, to the fore. And then that leads me then to leadership. And you really, very critically and in a very comprehensive manner, talked about leadership. Leadership can be defined, you know, in thousand words and then sentences and books. But at the end of the day, it has to be to respond to the needs of the citizens. And at the end of the day, it has to deliver on the promises made, you know, to the citizens. Unfortunately, too many promises made, too many promises broken. And where they are broken, then we ask, you know, where the accountability. And I think you use the word the abdication, you know, of leaders. And then we keep on seeing that, you know, again and again, since Almata, Bamako Initiative, Health for All by the year 2000, 15%, you know, going to, you know, the health sector with a focus you know, in addressing HIV and AIDS, universal health coverage, you name it. And then it goes on and on and on. And the promises are broken, the promises are broken. Where lies the accountability? And I think that is really you know, where you are putting a finger on. It is not rare nowadays that in many of the programs that both you and I have participated in, that we see 80% of the programs, and in some countries, 90%, of the whole program being funded you know, by foreign aid, by donors. And that is totally unacceptable. And then I think we should not brag you know, of having done that. But I think if that was an opportunity really to incentivize you know, everybody to play a role and then gaps you know, being filled and an additionality being brought in and not a substitution in terms of financing and a substitution in terms of taking responsibility. But let me tell you, citizens, you know, are not, you know, so weak as we may think, they remember. They remember the promises made and then the promises broken. And then they translate that in the level of trust and mistrust they have in their leaders. And what is now the most shared feeling among citizens, you know, across the board is a deficit of trust. And that leads me then into solidarity where that has, you know, moved many of us to have done the work that we are doing. Why we are all here to get to, together, you know, around the same table, you know, because at one point in time, we believed, you know, in that solidarity. We committed, you know, to that. We chose the path, you know, that we have chosen. We want to be global citizens, but now, Years after years, we are seeing some level of disillusion you know, in terms you know, of that solidarity. And I put your words, I heard them very loudly, that equity, fairness is not you know, the currency of the time. And that's exactly your words. And that's really what it means. You know, COVID-19 has come back and then exacerbated that. You know, is it necessary you know, that countries you know, hold vaccines that could cover 150% of their population. Is that necessary? You know, we cannot reproach any countries to think of their citizens first. That is absolutely okay. That we would like, you know, every country to do. We care about, you know, the American citizens the same way we care about the citizens in the global South. But it is really necessary that the global North hold, you know, all the vaccine for themselves and then repeat every day at nauseum and none of us is safe until we all are. Well, how do we translate that into action? So we are all missing, you know, that action to happen, to move from that, those words, you know, to the action. I think that we would like, to, you know, to see, you know, happening. Now, I fully agree with you when you say that the future, you know, is bright. It can only be brighter. Honestly, we cannot be worse, you know, than what we have reached now. I think we look at it, you know, from all corners, you know, that we are seeing. You mentioned, you know, all the right points there. The global institutions, you know, with all good intentions, you know, the lack of funding of the World Health Organization, less than 20%, you know, of the budget, your know, assets contributions, 
the flurry you know, of the uh, voluntary contribution, which is you know, directing you know, where you would like you know, to go and then it to be. While we are speaking now, you know, the, uh, the executive board you know, is meeting in Geneva and they're discussing you know, financing. And they simply can't agree to get even 50% of the budget you know, being funded by assets you know, contribution. And I think you know, when countries you know, meet today and we talk about you know, uh, getting you know, targets you know, that are ambitious enough or even you know, sharing what we already have you know, today, you know, we agree only on a process that would lead us, you know, to a decision by the year 2023 or 2024, which is then too late, you know, for too many, you know, by the time. I think what we are seeing here, and that's why I welcome the book, the sense of urgency, you know, that is really required, you know, today. I can read it and there are many things, you know, that we already know that we have not done. There may not be, you know, something extraordinary that is not there, but I think you communicating this sense of urgency, you know, pointing a finger to the societal and political issues and then the lens that I've been looking at, the importance of leadership, a committed leadership, a responsible leadership, a res- leadership that delivers and then address the needs of the citizens, mm. the active citizenship that will be holding leaders accountable and that should run beyond the confines you know, of geographies. And then if we care about solidarity, then we should also have the citizenship across border or global citizenship you know, that will put us in a movement you know, that will be addressing that for the sake of all. Because I agree, none of us is safe until we all are, but let's put it in practice. So thank you very much again you know, for ringing that alarm bell and then communicating the sense of urgency, you know, that we need today. Yeah. So. Thank you very, very much. Those are very excellent remarks about the sense of urgency, particularly as regards the shared accountability and responsibility, which really Soji uh, lays out brilliantly in the book. Um, Honorable Keith Martin, let me now turn to you. Uh, In Soji's book, he wrote about the contributions of universities and schools of public health to the North-South power imbalance in global health. How can those institutions be part of the solution to the power imbalances in global health today? Well, thank you very much, Aloysius. And I really, again, want to uh, echo the extraordinary work that Soji has done in this book and recommend it to everybody. And I'd like to your question, Aloysius, really gets to is a microcosm of what we've been talking about all along. And it underpins how the academic sector, which we have here at the Consortium of Universities for Global Health, we have 170 academic institutions around the world, and our focus is to improve the health of people and the planet, which is what we're talking about here today. But I want to just start with, uh, with Soji's favorite line of the book, A Brighter Future is Possible. I'd say it's not only possible, it's actually essential. And his powerful description of the past must inform us of where we go into the future and how we build forward better. Um, If we look at the pandemic, it really showed us the best and also the, the worst of us. The best in the production of the mRNA vaccine, the courage of South Africa to tell the world about the Omicron variant early on, regardless of the consequences to themselves and the ugly, the grotesque maldistribution of vaccines around the world, and frankly, the use of politics to advance domestic, narrow-minded political interests at the expense of a huge cost of life. And we've seen that in, uh, in various parts uh, of the world. To how to get to, to, to answer your question, Aloysius, really gets to how do we reform the sector uh, more broadly. And I just want to emphasize so a few points in from Soji's book. The first is that the host country, the recipient country, their needs and interests have to take primacy. That doesn't happen in the work in global health that, and I hate to say this, in, in academia is involved in, but there's you know, extraordinarily good people who are involved in the space. But I'll get to why we need, how we can change that in a second. Second point is capacity building. Now I'd say not only in the areas of Ministry of Health, but if we look at the countries in the world that are the poorest countries, the fragile countries, the failing nations, what do they have in common? Well, 
the lack and weakness of public institutions is central to that. It enables corrupt leaders to be able to co-opt and co-opt the state and use it for their interests and destroy and damage, kill, maim, and, and, and hurt people within their countries or in the region. And we have countless examples uh, of that. So it's not only capacity building the ministries of health, but I posit to you, they, every country, any stable country has to have a strong ministry of justice. It has to have public works. It has to have a strong ministry of finance. It has to have a capacity to tax the, the individuals working in that country to create the, the resources to pay for the public goods people's citizens require. It also requires a free press, which we neglect, and requires independent oversight of governance. So that when people are elected, they're electing the people they want, and those people are accountable to their citizens. Once that is severed, we can see that that's, that's the, a cancer that destroys the stability of, of any state. So how do we get there? And it goes, Aloysius, to your comment about reforming how academia and the development sector can actually work together. Right now, the incentives are all messed up. They're in the wrong space, as Soji describes clearly in his book. We, in order to change the incentives which follow the funding, we've got to change the funding. Funding will change the incentives. Of course, the incentives will, uh, will be changed if the funding is changed. The funding changes affects a changed culture. That changed culture will affect change activities, which will affect change outcomes. If we follow that line of logic and thinking, I think it will go a long way to achieving what Soji describes in his book uh, very clearly about the need to capacity building. Also, just to your point um, that uh, uh, Asin and Ritva uh, pointed out on reforming uh, the WHO, as Soji describes, and, and correct, the executive board just met in Geneva and couldn't get their act together. But there's two central areas in reforming the WHO, in my view, that, that uh, are essential. Not only to change the funding from a 20% assessed contribution to an 80% voluntary, but it needs to be flipped on its head. 80% assessed contributions, 20% voluntary. And that'll get to Soji's point about, about the co-opting of the activities. The second part deals with governance. The executive board is not a, 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 an executive board like other places. It doesn't have the power for the oversight and that is required for any organization. So to liberate the WHO and the extraordinary hardworking people who are there, you need to have a, an executive board that is independent, that can, that can actually exercise its oversight of the WHO. It also needs to be able to have independent data production Data production is done by representatives from the global south. And that data needs to be released publicly without any interference. It has to be able, you need to sever, in other words, you have to create a, a wall between the politics and the public uh, activities and normative functions of the WHO, which have to be independent of anything else. Otherwise you lose trust. And that will liberate the WHO to be the global public institution that we all want it to be. Finally, on the issue of corruption, which Soji describes, I mean, we have all been in a, a many different, uh, numerous discussions, and it drives me to distraction when the discussion of funding revolves around who's going to hit 0.7% of GDP for official development assistance. That is an absolute, in my view, moot point. ODA is $160 billion a year. What does it take to achieve the sustainable development goals? About $1.5 trillion a year. But here's the interesting thing, and this is the central point that I think is a cancer that is neglected in development, corruption. Corruption costs the global community 1.5 to $3 trillion a year, according to the IMF. Where does that money come from? A lot of it is stolen from low-income countries. Where does it go? High-income countries. It goes into the UK, Canada, the United States. It goes into, into um, shell companies, bank accounts and it goes into assets. Those are, are hidden and stored in rich countries. So the, the, the hypocrisy of this is that on one hand, affluent countries are talking about investing in development in low-income countries, but on the other hand, they're benefiting 10 times the amount of official development assistance. And when low-income countries try to get that money back, what happens? They can't. High-income country, countries make it very difficult to repatriate those funds. So those trillions of dollars right now are sitting in high-income country bank accounts and in assets 
and, are, and belong to low-income countries. That needs to be returned. And on any, on any, unless high-income countries are going to stand up and go ahead and, and return that money, then, then that's utter hypocrisy. Then we cannot talk about development and having the kind of, uh, and end the neo-dependency that, that Soji powerfully describes in his book. And finally, this only happens as a consequence of leadership. So all of us who are involved in development, in my view, we need to talk about the practical solutions that Soji describes in his book to be able to work with our colleagues responsibly as defined by them, meeting their needs to build their capacity to create the independence that any stable country wants and any prosperous country wants. Without that, we're just perpetuating the, the status quo and that uh, was, is utterly hypo uh, hypocritical. Um, thanks so much, Aloysius. just over to you. Thank you, thank you very, very much. I think the central message about the, the cancer of corruption which unfortunately remains a major impediment to effective development uh, remains uh, something we have been struggling with. I remember way back when, I'm sure Ridva will remember, when Wolfenson first joined the World Bank as president, uh, one of his first annual meeting remarks was this notion of the cancer of corruption. So thank you very, very much for those remarks. Let me now turn to Soji. Um, it's interesting because in the foreword to your book, Professor Jim Jamison, uh, Dean Jamison wrote that your conclusions are as radical as they are clear. Conservative opposition is inevitable. What do you think um, very briefly that uh, Professor Jamison uh, was alluding to here? Thank you, Aloysius. And uh, I wanna thank Dean for uh, taking the time uh, to write the forward to this book. First, let me say what Dean was not referring to because I think that's important. He was, when he said conservative opposition is inevitable, he was not referring to any political leaning or anything like that. No, I don't think that's what uh, President Dean Jamison was referring to. He was referring to opposition from those institutions, those constructs that benefit from the status quo. I mentioned some of them before, but since this is about power, it's opposition deriving from a fear of giving up power. That really is it fundamentally. So if you are in a position where you have been dictating to countries of the global South, again, this is not individual malice. Let's be clear about this. We're talking about the construct, the, the, the meta system, if you're in a position in which you've been dictating to countries of the global south, then it's gonna be very hard to voluntarily give that up. And we talked about influences on WHO, about uh, the reluctance on the part of uh, the World Bank to invest in the Africa Centers for Disease Control. Uh, we talked about how the Global Fund and Gavi, for example, need to switch into replenishment for exit. Of course, they are going to resist that. I'll be amazed if they didn't, because it would, it would go against the, the normal experiences of when folks have to give up power in that sense. Uh, we talked about, about USAID, I'm not gonna repeat that, and exemplar, uh, examples on the, on the foundation front and also the Northern NGOs, as well as Southern leaders and ASC, uh, said that more eloquently uh, than, uh, than, than, than I could. So it's about resistance from entrenched interests. That is it. And in, in the book, I quoted Wale Shoyinka, Professor Wale Shoyinka, where he said, power and truth are in conflict. So when the truth is that this thing needs to be reformed and overhauled, that is in conflict with power. And that is where the opposition will come from. Excellent, very good. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, let me turn to you, uh, uh, Ridva. Uh, any comments on the situation we find ourselves now as regards uh, vaccines? When reading the book, just to, uh, to frame the question, I can really see from this very, rich and broad and important conversation that I look at 
hell still from outside, from the country perspective and the whole sort of government perspective in that country. It, it, it is really very clear. And maybe my message generally would be that uh, the, the, and uh, I mean, this book and this seminar has highlighted that it actually shocks me. I didn't realize that issues are so bad. I, I didn't. But it is also important for global health people to situate them in a country context and government context and not just look at health alone. That That is really uh, uh, my message. But I wanted to come uh, as a practical person. I really, when I observe what has happened during the last few years, to me, it seems obvious that Africa needs its own vaccine production. I mean, the book, it discusses property rights, um, but I think there is more to it. Like what about India that built an ecosystem and research and investment that led into massive production of, of medicine and drugs and generic drugs. And uh, when I have observed COVID, you talk about it quite a bit on the book, we haven't talked so much, so much some in, during the seminar, is I've, I've seen just as an observant, really, a star, which is the African CDC. I mean, I had, that has been so wonderful from the perspective I'm able to judge it. What is that role? And what is the role of, of global health? To, it's obvious that that capacity, Africa now has 1.3 billion people in 25 years, two and a half billion. It's obvious there needs to be capacity. It's gonna be Senegal, uh, perhaps Pasteur Institute or something regional. Um, that, that I was looking for something like that. We don't have to delve too much perhaps because the seminar has a very broad take, but uh, that was very important in my view, how to create that capacity. All right. Thank you very much, Ridva. Um, let me turn to one of our audience questions. Uh, I am particularly delighted because this is from an area of the world where we rarely, rarely get questions. This is from the Solomon Islands. And it's by Mary Gape. I hope I'm pronouncing your uh, name well. Uh, uh, her organization is the uh, Temolu Educational Authority, and she works in early childhood care and education as an officer there. She says, here in the Solomon Islands, COVID-19 just reached us in January and is spreading rapidly and is very difficult to control, particularly for those of us looking after fellow teachers and early learners. Does your panel have any advice for us on the front line of this pandemic? Um, Brother As, do you, do you want, I would like, like you to, you know, to shed some light on this and then we'll go to Keith as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you to the colleagues from Solomon Island. We, there is a lot we can learn from Solomon Island that also applies to COVID. That is uh, the resilience you know, of the island in terms of you know, shocks and hazards you know, that are related to extreme weather events and then climate change. That is preparedness, early alert, early warning, early response, resilience building. You take out climate, you apply that to COVID, you have exactly the same. And I think that's what we need. But once you get there, there is some common goods that we all have, which is depending now on our own behaviors and attitudes. That is how much you know, we do in terms of respecting you know, the counter, the protective measures, like all the barrier methods that we know, you know we can do that and that is upon us. I understand that behavior change is not easy, but well, we really have to do that, you know, in order to protect ourselves. And then only after that, can we use technology, which is something which is often beyond our control in order to strengthen the base, you know, that is inside us. 
and in technology today, and it is unfortunate to count it as technology because the rich world has grabbed everything that was you know, available on the market, starting with masks, hand sanitizers, PPEs, even before we talk about vaccines. And I think those are the things that you know, we need to do but the more you have, the more resilient your society is. And I think what we can learn, you know, from the resilience to climate, you know, of those big island, you know, big, um, uh, what I want to say, you know, one, uh, one, one, one friend from the Salome Island said, it's, well, okay, you are a small island. He said, no, I'm a big ocean country. So from those big ocean countries, you know, that we can learn, you know, that, you know, to apply you know, those type of resilience, the preparedness, and then the early response, you know, to it, while we all together work to address the common challenges, you know, that Soji has highlighted in terms of equity, in terms of also fairness, in terms of access, you know, to commodities that will make us all safe. Keith, any thoughts on uh, Mary's question from Solomon Islands? Well, thank you, Mary, for, no thanks, Alicia, and thank you, Mary, for posing this question. The first thing you've done is actually brought up the plight of the Solomon Islands to the world. Yeah. And that's, the, that's, a, that's a great, great thing that you have done. Yeah. Uh, second, uh, song I said about the, if you have vaccine, vaccines, get them. If you don't, mask wearing, social distancing. But what we learned early on, because before vaccines were available at CUGH, yeah. we actually interviewed uh, representative leaders from Taiwan, South Korea, and Japan. Mm -hmm. uh, about what they were doing effectively. And what's critically important is for political leaders mm -hmm. to express clearly and communicate to the public clearly, factually, follow the public health and do it frequently. In that way, the public has the best chance of you know, the protecting yourself. And mm -hmm. that's a fundamental role of political leaders. So they have to, they need to exercise that role. Thank you, Mary. Yeah. All right. Very good. Let me do one very, very quick round of uh, uh, questions for, for you uh, to react very quickly because the book does spend some time on technical assistance, especially technical assistance at currently practice in global health. And the question is, is it possible to make a change from traditional technical assistance to technical assistance partnerships? If so, how, how will this come about, uh, Brother C? Yeah, partnership is about sharing, sharing of information, you know, sharing of knowledge and sharing of power. And that's where I land again, you know, where Soji has concluded. And it has to be, you know, let's start again, you know, among citizens, you know, between uh, men and women, between those in rural areas and in the urban settings, you know, between um, those, you know, went to formal schools and then those were considered to be the greatest mass, between the north and the south, between the rich and the poor, and then between this generation and the next one, because we're talking about global health. It's about not only today, it's about also the future. What are we going to be doing today in terms of partnership and sharing, you know, to have the future we want, the future for our children and the future of this planet. And I think those are really for me, you know, the key issues, you know, that we need to, you know, bear in mind again from a broader uh, political societal, you know, landscape. And then we can drill down from that you know, to concrete public health measures, global health measures that will take us incrementally to it. Kate, on the same issue of technical assistance. Thanks, Alusha. So at the Consortium of Universities for Global Health, I would encourage everybody to come out to our conference, cugh2022.org, it's in March. We'll be mm -hmm. dealing with these issues. From right. academia's perspective, what has to change in my view is that we need, tenure needs to be reformed. Tenure in its current construct will not be able uh, universities to be able to work um, constructively with our partners in low resource settings, which we're doing at CUGH. We're working on trying to align and connect the training capabilities with training needs. We have a number of platforms uh, on that. 
but we need to tenure needs to be reformed. Right now, you're not you're actually not you're not actually rewarded for being able to do the kind of capacity building that we're talking about here. For that to happen, the funding needs to change. As I mentioned before, if the funding change, if the big funders change that are funding global health right now in academia, they need to assert that and align that with, with different outcomes, including capacity building, including working and enabling low resource settings to get grants, lead grants, develop their own plans. If you do that, then we'll have a constructive uh, structure for capacity building and for academia to work more co collectively and more effectively to be able to build capacity in low, low resource settings. But that's an issue of leadership and we all must speak out to affect that change. Thanks, Aloysius. Um, River, same question. You've led many teams that have done technical assistance work. <laughs> what's, what's no, actually, <laughs> I, I must say that I have been a big person always and still am on actually budget support. I, I really don't even, I was happy not to have any technical assistance attached mm -hmm. to it. Let the government's own institutions channel it. Yes. And because I'm an economist, I believe in, I, I know fungibility yeah. is real. So even yeah. if you think you ring fence, you don't, you can't yeah. do it. Yeah. But perhaps to add to this is for me, and I've learned this when working with the education sector. Education sector, by the way, talks so much less about money. It's very interesting because they really say, they look at their, how much does money affect learning? And it's like a, like a starry sky, there is no trend. So, so it's very interesting to hear that emphasis on funding and how funding affects incentives. So actually it's, it's a surprise, but what I wanted to say that in the education field, when you ask what is what to do about technical assistance, I like to think about issues first, symptoms. So symptoms have been laid out here. Then you need actually a proper diagnostic. Like what are the kind of proximate causes of these symptoms? And then only later on, are you able to come to therapeutics? Sort of that it's not, you can't just, jump in quickly to say, and, and that's what I, I tried also in my comments to, from the economics perspective to say, yes, it's about incentives. Incentives are created many other things also, but uh, except money, but, um, but it, if you, if the community of global health wants to really deal with this, it takes a proper laying out the symptoms, surely, some of it is in this book. Doing diagnostic as much as needed. There is academia, there is operations, there, there are many actors. And, and then kind of in a collaborative effort to look for therapeutics, to go well beyond the wishful ideas how it should be. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh us just a minute concluding remarks I, I will just uh, borrow uh, what what Keith said you know which uh, you know reminded me very much of my times working in humanitarian settings mm. shocks and hazards you know like covid you know they they are big revealers they can reveal the best in us and the worst in us mm -hmm. and then here we have a choice and the choice is definitely to you know, make, you know, the best in us overtake the worst. And I think that's what we'll conclude with uh, Soji's words of a brighter future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Keith, last word, oh, one I, minute. I, I just wanted to thank you very much. I hope that, uh, that our listeners will work with uh, our, our colleagues in, in a more responsible way that, that uh, Soji has outlined in his powerful book. Uh, we have a lot to learn from what's yeah. in that book, and I hope we just take those lessons to heart and and implement. Yeah. Uh, wishful thinking without action doesn't change anything, but we have to act and yeah. act to act uh, in a way that is uh, going to be impactful and reform the systems yeah. before us. So thank you, Aloysius. Thank you. Ritva, last word. Just also 
thank you very much for for <laughs> inviting me. That made me read the book from cover to cover. I didn't know, Sorti, that you think sometimes in Latin, but I learned it uh, from the book. But I do think the agenda is so big that then maybe put some of it parts, and I would really like to see actually some change taking right. place yeah. um, in a collab in a collaborative effort. So I just yeah. want to thank you. It was a pleasure being part of the Brookings and the Africa Growth Initiative Seminar. So thank you. You're most welcome. Thank you. Soji, last word. Thank you, Aloysius, Ritva, Keith, us, and the entire Brookings uh, team. I want to close by paraphrasing the late Senator Robert Francis Kennedy, who said, some people look at things as they are and ask why. I look at things as they are and ask, as they, I, I ask, why not have things be otherwise? So in this book, I look at the why. Why are things the way they are? Mm. And then pivot, say, why not? Mm. Why not make things better? Mm -hmm. So we thanks the challenge, the collective challenge to all of us mm. is to rise to the occasion, make things better, and new dependency so that the generation coming before us will face a different set of challenges. They will not be wallowing in self-pity and they will not be indulging in new dependence. A brighter future is possible. Thank you. On those optimistic note, thank you very much, Soji, for putting us um, um, this excellent book in our hands to chew on and discuss today. Ridva, very grateful for your presence here, Keith Martin, and of course, um, as C. Thank you all, and thank you very, very much. On behalf of the Brookings Africa Growth Initiative, thank you very much. Bye bye. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.